Hi, I'm Karina Walter, and welcome to the Standard Newsroom. I'm here with St. Catharines Mayor Walter Senzik for our monthly chat with the mayor, Ask Senzik. It's welcome. great to be back. You were out tree planting earlier today, I believe. I was out tree planting. I had a, had a shovel, got to plant a couple trees, and we were in Burgoyne Woods. It is a gem in our community, and for the last two years, IKEA and Trees Canada have partnered up to plant over 200 trees. And so today's planting was the inner ring of the main part of Burgoyne Woods, and it was a great opportunity to see IKEA workers from the, the store in St. Catharines and members of our parks team came out and they were planting trees that are very uh, specific to our climate. So they would be, it's the naturalization of making sure that our tree species is in line with what has traditionally grown in our community. So it was wonderful to learn about the trees that they were planting as well. I know the city's been working hard to try and boost up its tree canopy. Um, hasn't been helped by some some residents up in the uh, <laughs> the north end. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great reminder that when it when it comes to trees on public properties, it's illegal to cut them down, and it's something that we are not going to tolerate, and we're going to discourage. And those who we find that have committed that act of taking down trees will be fined accordingly. And the reality is is that we have the emerald ash borer that has ripped through communities across Ontario, southern Ontario and we can't afford to continue to lose more of our tree canopy. Our urban tree canopy is, is one of the more important parts of our infrastructure. And people don't always look at, at trees as infrastructure, but when you plant a tree and it grows for 50 years, in terms of the economic and environmental benefit that comes back, and I use the word economic because it helps to create shade for trees and homes and parks and helps to keep the temperature of our, our, our cities lower because you have that component of shading that takes place and so it acts as a carbon sink for parts of our, our community. And we have a number of parks that we're naturalizing and turning back into forested areas and that's part of our climate change adaptation, trying to make sure that we're being a part of climate change adapta adaptation and making sure that we're trying to mitigate the impacts of, of climate change. So this is an important endeavor for us and it's sometimes overlooked because you know you plant a tree and it's only yay mm -hmm. high. But as they say, we're planting, the tree we plant today will provide the shade for generations to come. And that's why I think these initiatives are, are important. And I want to thank Trees Canada and IKEA for the work that they're doing. Do you know how many trees they put in today, by any chance? 100. Oh, okay. They did 100 uh, today. And then last year, same time, they did another 100. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to Burgoyne Woods, for those who are going to go out there, you're going to see the little saplings. And we ask that people be careful and, and make sure that we're, we're all looking after the, the trees in our own way. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about um, last night, taking yeah, you back to a regional council meeting. I have, I've completely forgotten about last night. Yeah. You've had two council meetings like within Wednesday two and days. Thursday. Wednesday and Thursday with a special city council meeting. Uh, you were asked again about the Burgoyne Bridge and the St. Catharines emails related to a couple of years um, and emails, staff emails. What is the, um, What's the final word on this? You've been clear that the, the bridge itself is not a city project. Yeah, it's not a city project at all. And, and it's, it was interesting. There wasn't a lot of asking going on last night. It was a lot of um, comments that were being made. And it is unfortunate because I, I, I do believe that regional council should be a forum in which we have robust discussions, respectful dialogue and debate. And it's unfortunate on this issue, it seems to have really torn at the edges of a, a lot of folks. Uh, from my perspective, I think we've made it crystal clear from the city council's purview and from our staff that we've done everything that we've, we can to be a part of the investigation and we've been working hand in hand with regional staff. Now, whether certain folks who sit on regional council are aware of that, uh, we've tried to explain that there has been a very symbiotic relationship. But um, unfortunately, some folks choose to just not listen, maybe. And so, the result from last night is that we're going to have our team come to the Burgoyne Bridge Task Force, and our team being our IT, legal, and our CAO, and explain exactly what's transpired, where we have been able to hand over any information related to the investigation, and get to the concrete answers instead of these shadow questions that lead to uh, down rabbit holes that never materialize into anything. So I'll just say this, frustrating that the investigation has taken this long. 
I'm hoping that we're going to have a final report before the end of this council. And the public needs to see the audited report. Whatever legally we can show, it needs to be made available. And so we only got a couple months left of this term. And I hope the task force turns its attention to completing the task it was created to do. And then we can move forward and whatever whatever directions need to be taken, whatever policy adjustments need to be made, whatever procurement strategies or procurement processes we need to close up, we should do it and then move on because it's getting kind of tiresome. I actually had a reader who asked when the Burgoyne Bridge audit report, the unedited version will be released to the public. So there will be something coming. There will be something. The, the OPP are still investigating and I'm hoping that investigation wraps up fairly soon. And then once that's all complete, release it to the public. You know, it has to go through a legal process, but release it to the public. Let them see what, let them see what happened and let them make their own, own decisions. But um, it's, th this can't continue to go on and it's, it's become uh, quite irksome. One of the ideas that came up last night was to disband the audit committee yeah. and actually just bring the information straight to counselors from now on. Is that That'd be great. Support? I, I, I'm on the task force. I totally support that. But the reality is, is that we got to go through this process with our city staff to get in front of the task force, debunk all of this myth making that's out there, and then move forward with the next, the final stage of, of, of this task force. And I think after they hear from the city staff, I think we'll be able to then say, let's put a timeline in place. Let's put a hard end on this, work towards it, and get the report out. Because the, the, the public, we've spent a ton of money on this, which, again, is an irritant for myself. A little bit too much money has been spent on this investigation. But hopefully, it, in the end, it'll shed a light on everything, and we can move forward on this regional project. They said they needed the St. Catharines tapes for the investigation to be complete. But what exactly are they looking for on the St. Catharines tapes? Because my understanding is it's a regional project St. Catharines gave some money for the landscaping, but everything else has been decided on the regional side, no? Yeah, it was completely, it was all decided by regional council and regional government. Uh, the interesting point is that if there was any emails exchanged using the regional account, well, the region would already have all these emails. Oh, that's what I was... If any city staff or city individuals emailed a regional staff member, it's still going to be captured on the regional serve server. So. This whole thing that there's something missing that's going to lead us down, it's like there's a smoking gun somewhere. Um, I, think some, I think some folks have been just watching too much detective work on TV. Maybe it's time to turn off the Netflix and just pay attention to actually what's going on in front of you. Interesting. Uh, well, we'll move on to some other city issues. Sure. You had a really long uh, meeting about the Port Lucy Lincoln Fabrics building and the developers' plans to turn it into condos and add an addition on. What were your impressions? I, I actually think it was a very informative meeting, and it was, our, it was a public meeting. So the next meeting will be our decision meeting. So this was the opportunity for the public to come forward. I think we had 12 speakers that spoke that night. It looks to be a, a project that is, a, is attempting to fit into what is the uh, sort of the heritage, but also the future of Port Dalhousie. I think a lot of folks get stuck on the Port Dalhousie of 50 years ago versus the Port Dalhousie that was really there 110 years ago. And that, that really came out in the presentation. Mm -hmm. And then they had a, a history, con a, a heritage consultant come in and actually show pictures of the 1900s, over 100 years ago, what Port looked like. And specifically that industrial part of Port, mm -hmm. which had factories on it. And it was a man-made piece of land structure that was once a waterway. And so this, this whole concept that this area, in terms of its heritage component, this, that was all scrub industrial land. And so, again, folks who are hearkening back to a, a, a heritage time, this heritage consultant was saying, well, this was all industrial anyway. And really, the building that is the, in this, in the historical building is being preserved. Yes, they're building another building beside it, and then the Rankin project will be just further down. But in terms of the history of that parcel of land, it was always just scrub industrial land. And at, before that, it was a waterway. So to come forward and say that we just got to preserve it in a pristine state that it is today with just one building, that's not the historical nature of that property. So that was, a, that was an eye-opener for me because a lot of folks talk about the heritage in that part of, 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 the, of the community. So council now has to wait for staff recommendation. Staff will take the community's input, the 
stat the, the, the consultant's input, the input from what would be the, 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 uh, the architects, and then the provincial guidelines and put it all together and come up with a staff, staff recommendation. And it's, it's, it's an exciting time because it gives us an opportunity. And as one gentleman said, our, our process sets the stage for buildings that will be there for the next 100 years. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be great to look back and say, what role did we have in playing on creating a space in which people can come to port, not just enjoy it, but live in port. We're creating more space for people to live in port. So council will have some tough decisions to make ahead of it, but I think the, the, the proponents of the development have made a strong case at least how their vision ties into what the new port would look like. Do you think those decisions by council will be made before the election? Yes. Yeah, they should be made in, in June, early July. And then, you know, and then I gotta say, other folks have come up and said, we, you know, we elected you to not approve these. And we had an individual speak in front of us that said, uh, you, you were elected and you ran on, you know, did you run on, 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 on allowing for these buildings to take place? The reality is that these two projects, they weren't even on the books. Mm -hmm. They were, they, so for someone to say that they ran on blocking these projects, these projects didn't come onto the books until after this term of council was, was, was formed. So these are two brand new projects, which is in, it's good to see, and now we have an opportunity to debate, have a healthy debate about it, and then make a decision. Got a few really good questions from readers that came in through Facebook and email and one on Twitter as well, so we'll just uh, get to those. Um, I have a question from a reader asking what you are hearing from the provincial election campaigns that may impact the city for better or worse and uh, the city's relationship with the province. Well, and it's a great question because this is going to be a, a, a fundamental turning point no matter what come June 7th. And I say a fundamental turning point because I think you're going to see a change of government. And whatever change that, that, that takes, we have to work with the new government. That being said, we've made it very clear, and so have the, the, the other mayors that I'm a part of, the Large Urban Mayors Caucus, and as a group, we've talked about we do not want to see downloading back to municipalities on social services as a way to balance the provincial books. That can't happen. We also want to make sure that when it comes to affordable housing, that we're partners in the, 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 the construction and, and creation of, of affordable housing in communities, but the the province can't abdicate its, uh, its responsibility there. Looking at additional funding for mental health, we gotta, we're facing it in the community of St. Catharines. We're, I, we're verging on a crisis in mental health because we're seeing a rise in our community from those who are suffering from mental health il illnesses. So those are areas that we want to be in line with the next government, whatever that may be. Um, a say, supervised injection site or supervised consumption site, as they say. Our council voted unanimously in support of one St. Catharines, and we're gonna hold the next government to, to that. That needs to be in our toolbox. And everyone locally is saying that needs to be part of our toolbox. That's part of what a compassionate city looks like. So these are core fundamental parts of what, what, who we are, um, but we're also looking to ensure that when it comes to things like the green belt, that the green belt is kept intact. And yeah, it would be great as a city as if we can continue to grow into suburbia. That would take over too much farmland. That would jeopardize future generations being able to have the advantage of having farmlands. And it would hurt our, our, in, our, our green space, our environmental space that surrounds us. That's not an appropriate way for communities to grow, I believe, today. I think we have to create an additional incentives to grow vertically. And I think the provincial government needs to be a partner at that table to help create the incentives for, for communities like St. Catharines to grow. So, you know, it's going to be June 8th is everyone's going to be waking up in the province of Ontario and a lot of the mayors across this province are going to be looking and going, okay, what tack do we take now? Mm. So it's interesting times. You mentioned um, affordable housing and I have a question from a reader about the uh, project at Church and Court Street. They said the ground on the lot was broken a year ago to build new low-income housing, but there's been no movement since then. The area seems abandoned with heavy equipment fencing and a shallow hole in the ground. Uh, the city of St. Catharines recently received $2.8 for affordable housing. Is this new building expected to be finished soon? 
Yes, and so the 2.8 million is for a different in incentive program that the City of St. Catharines will be working on for creating additional affordable housing spaces. The project that the individual was talking about is the Bethlehem project with Pantera and the foundation permits, everything has been submitted to the City of St. Catharines. We're going through the process of getting the applications ready for so that the construction company can commence. Uh, from what we've been uh, informed is that early fall, likely September, is where you'll start to see the excavation of coming out of the ground. They're, they are doing preparatory work for that, so while the individual, yes, there is a machine there, the machine does work at times, and it's getting the ground prepared for the actual staging of the, of the project. Okay, so there's a lot of behind the scenes things going on yep. after the groundbreaking. Once, <laughs> once, the, once the hole is dug and the foundations are up, that'll go up, that'll go up quickly. I have a question from Twitter. You asked the mayor if he believes that all the designations of employment versus residential lands in the city's inventory are appropriate for St. Catharines planned growth. And it's an interesting question because a, a lot of folks would be looking at what are our employment lands and under the mm -hmm. official plan for the city of St. Catharines that's approved by the region and the province. We have to designate space within our community for employment lands and traditionally these employment lands would be uh, situated in areas where you'd see manufacturing companies. So any space where you see large-scale manufacturing or warehousing, places like that, that would be traditionally described as employment lands under our official plan. Is it a different designation <coughs> from industrial land or is it the same? Same, okay. same, because it's, it's cap captured as employment. This is where, so our official plan where people can build manufacturing, you'd have classified as industrial class. Layered on top of that would be, that would be an employment area. And what we're looking at is we are landlocked we have a fixed amount of space within our community and we want to make sure that under our employment, future employment land uh, availability, that we look at the redefinition of what employment lands mean. So there's going to be actually be a report coming in June about employment lands in St. Catharines and it's an, our opportunity as council and as members of the public to talk about what does the future of employment lands look like. And I got to tell you, Karina, with robotics and AI, those kind of new technologies and how they're having an impact on communities. You look at a place like a warehouse, and with automation in a warehouse today, you may have four people working in a warehouse. So how is that employment lands? Now on the flip side of that, you have a long-term care facility. And a long-term care facility, 24-hour care, looking after people, you would have upwards of 50 to 60 people working in that facility. Same size as a warehouse potentially, mm -hmm. many more people employed. Yet under the employment lands, the long-term care facility, you can't place it there. So we have to really understand where the future of job growth and job creation is going to come from. And while we have a strong footprint of manufacturing in our community, is manufacturing part of the employment land studies and is that the only designation that we should be applying to employment lands? And so I think you're going to hear a lot of future thinking on this issue because we've got to be thinking about where our city is going to be in the next 30 years not what it was like 30 years ago. And that's where the employment land definitions today, I think, are still thinking about employment lands 30 years ago. We've got to be thinking 30 years out. One more question, because we're running out of time. I had a reader asking about, uh, this is a regional question, I guess, or an MTO question, but hopefully you know. Why is there still not an on-off ramp from the 406 to the hospital? So that definitely is an MTO and, and regional, uh, regional government jurisdiction. Both of those would be layered over top of each other. They are going through a, a master plan at the region and look regional master plan for transportation. So I know that is a part of the discussion about what the on and off ramp in that area would look like. Currently as of today, looking at the capacity, uh, we're not seeing that there's a need today, but it does need to be part of a long-term plan. And we're looking forward to the completion of the transportation master plan to see how that factors into sort of the flow of that whole area. I know there's a lot of issues associated with it, uh, but whatever comes forward, we're gonna make sure we have a lot of community input as well. well. Thanks for coming in. Are you heading to the rank and run tomorrow? Heading to the rank and run, looking forward to that. I'm, I'm running with, uh, running with the, the Hansberger family and, and little Jacob is battling cancer. And so um, Bryce, and, Bryce and his team, I'm gonna join their team and, and do a good run. I, I ran for, with Jacob last year. He ran the last part of the race, and we're hoping Jacob uh, can make it out tomorrow and, and run a bit of the race. But it's a, it's a close one for a lot of people in our community. 
and uh, cancer has, a, has, has left its, its ugly footprint on a lot of people. And um, I know we're going to have a lot of support out there for, for everyone who's gone through cancer in our community. I will see you there tomorrow. And for those of you who are watching and have questions of your own for the mayor, you can tweet them out with the hashtag AskSensit or email me at karina.walter at niagaradailies.com and we will have the mayor back again next month for our online chat. Looking forward to it. Thanks.